And joining us once again, he's a returning guest. We had a returning guest last week and once again this Thursday as well. Last time he was here, kind of a little preface this before we hear Craig's voice, um, we talked about Kyler Murray, Cam Newton, and Jameis Winston. Now, only two of the three have touched the field in significant fashion this year. Jameis did touch the field this past Sunday. But we're not going to talk about all three of them this week, only two of the three. It is Craig Campbell, co-host of The Final Score. Craig, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jay. I'm happy to be back. Um, you know, it's 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 been great watching uh, watching you, your show, and all this other stuff you're involved in. Just watching you grow, man. We've we were talking about this in the springtime. These guys and kind of bringing back to it, but also you know we're talking about how your show and your viewership and everything has been growing. I'm so happy to see all the stuff that you're involved with, and I'm just happy to be back and uh, talk some more football. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Thanks for the kind words. It's definitely fun. Uh, Colts, Ohio State, this one here. I love everything that's going on. And in regards to the players that we're talking about today, and those of you that just heard, we're going to focus on Kyler Murray, Cam Newton, and then Antonio Brown, which I know a lot of you love him, the player, maybe not so much the individual that does the things that he does off of the field. Kyler Murray, the quarterback, I was high on him early on. You were high on him, if I remember correctly, early on in the offseason as well. And this year, it seems like year number two, when a lot of quarterbacks, they either take a step back or their, or their progress gets halted because there's a lot more film on them. Year number two, Kyler Murray, Craig, he is playing very, very well. Yeah, and we talked about this, like you said, in the in the early offseason. You know, we said that's a team to watch out for. They they stayed in games when they needed to. Kyler Murray, you could see the glimpses. You could see the mistakes, but he's a rookie quarterback. But just this year, uh, already he's, he's 12th in the NFL in passing yards. But just from a rushing standpoint, we know he's a dual threat. Um, he is 8th. He's top 10 in the NFL in overall rushing, not just quarterbacks. Um, but he's got that. He's tied for third in rushing touchdowns. He's got eight on the year. That's that's insane, like, as far as what he's been able to do. Because, like you said, most players, you see a little bit of a step back because there's a lot more film. But in most of the games that he's played, he's looked really well. You can even look back to last weekend against Tua Tagaviola and that duel that they had. He was 21 of 26 on a much improved Miami defense. But he averaged, you can see some of the averages on this game. They're starting to chuck the ball a little bit more down the field. It helps they got DeAndre Hopkins, but they're throwing <laughs> the ball more down the field. You can see that in his averages, and you can really tell um, his improvement. A couple games here and there, but for the most part, I mean, he's making good decisions. And not only that, you can tell once you can give him the ability to kind of create plays and maybe extend plays, he's not taking as many sacks as I thought he would this year, which is fantastic for his progression. Uh, and when he can be a dual threat as a runner and a thrower, man, watch out. He's he's dangerous. He is very dangerous. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned the sacks because I remember last year, and I looked at this stat a lot last season. Stat, I looked at this recently for a show that I was on, and I was talking about how it was – I know what it was. It was the Colts when they were playing the Bengals. The Bengals' O-line is atrocious. doesn't take long to figure that out. There's a good chance that Joe Burrow will get sacked at least 50 times this year alone, and they have, we're just now at the halfway point in the season. That's how bad their O-line is. Well, last year you had the Cardinals' O-line that was horrible, the Buccaneers' offensive line that was horrible, and you saw Jameis and Kyler Murray – get sacked quite a bit. As bad as the O-line of the Chargers was last year, and everybody harped on how Phillip Rivers was running around for his life, I believe he only got sacked 33 times last year. So that may be the veteran in him, but their O-line was bad, but not as bad as the Buccaneers or the Cardinals. To date, as of right now, Kyler Murray's only been sacked 10 times. And he's only lost, and he's only lost 57 yards that are sack yards, yards that have been lost. That's huge. And you mentioned how much he runs. I believe it's 543 on 76 carries so far in the season. 2100, over 2,100 passing yards on the season. He can do it all. He can, he can do it in, with his arm. He can do it with his legs. And, Craig, I don't know how you feel with this. I'm going to throw it off to you here in a second. But these guys that are coming out of college that can not only play quarterback in the NFL – but can play baseball as well. And the first name, I, th I think of three names. Well, I think of two names. I think of a dual threat, in, dual threat in Russell Wilson, a dual threat in Kyler Murray. Both of those guys, Craig, they find ways to do it with their legs and with their arm, but they don't need their legs to be 
successful. They could do it with both. And if push comes to shove, they can win the game with their arm, which makes them very, very, very hard to stop. Absolutely. You mentioned those two guys. Um, I think that's a great comparison because those guys – and you can look at all the other dual threat quarterbacks who have come through. You can throw out Cam Newton. You can throw out RG3 when he was in the league. Um, you know, these two guys, Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson, they look to pass first, run second. Yes. And I yes. think that's what the big difference is. The ability that they know they can run when they have to, but they choose to pass first really helps. And you mentioned the 10 sacks. Here's a fun fact for you. Five of those sacks came in the first two games. He's only been sacked either zero or one times the remainder of the season every nice. game. Nice. Nice. I didn't I did not know that. But that little tidbit, it also shows not just the growth with him, but the growth of the other players on the offense. And when I think about offenses that are respected but not respected enough, I think in my aspect, I don't know about you, but I just think that the Cardinals offense, you already know you're bringing in DeAndre Hopkins. You mentioned that earlier, who fits in very, very well in that in that scheme and that offensive set. You already have Larry Fitzgerald, who's just who's the old man. We all talk about Frank Gore and how long he's playing. Larry Fitzgerald is just out there in Arizona, living his life. Like, hey, I'm out here on the West Coast, basically West Coast. Just leave me alone. I'll be in, I'll be in Phoenix, enjoying this weather. You guys can complain about everything else and complain about how all these receivers. I mean, they get hurt. Now here I am. Just don't. I don't drop the ball. I'll be right here, wide open. And that's just Larry Fitzgerald to me. But then you had all the offensive weapons. You add in a coach that understands how to utilize prolific athletes, elite athletes in this way. Kyler Murray, one thing I, I would want to say, I want to see him improve upon, which this is going to be a number we'll talk about with Cam Newton. I'm just very critical. I would love to see him above 70% completion percentage. He is right now at 68.1, which isn't bad. It's not, it's not horrible. It's not atrocious. But I would love to see him at 70, 71, 71 and a half, just because I know he can take his game up a notch to that next level. And I... I there was a time, Craig, I was critical of short quarterbacks. I would say short quarterbacks, you cannot be good. If you're under if you're under 6'2", I don't want you. Really, if you're under 6'3", I don't want you at all. You have Kyler Murray 5'10", Russell Wilson 5'10". Another comparison with these two guys, not only are they dual threat, not only are they guys that can beat you prolifically with their legs, they can, but they want to pass first, but they're short. And their height doesn't hurt them, Craig. Do you think this may be a trend where – Coaches down the road, they may see a guy under six foot and say, hey, we're going to give you a shot. We have two guys that, have done, that are doing this right now. Yes, they're baseball guys. They, can, they have a way with their arm that other guys don't. But we're going to give you a shot because we truly believe that even though you're shorter than the average person, you can be very, very good on our team. Absolutely. I think that's more of a, a, a kind of a testament to these guys. They have very quick releases and their coaches, Pete Carroll and Cliff Kingsbury, they know how to move the pocket. Because if you have a, you know, Drew, we've seen kind of Drew Brees starting to show this where guys are starting to just, guys are starting to get in the passing lanes because maybe they're not getting the ball as quickly uh, out of their hands and they're they're making longer decisions. That's where you see those mistakes come in. So uh, I, it's a big testament to the coaching staff of drawing up the types of, of plays in that offense to be able to get the ball out quickly move the pocket if need be, but to them, you, you mentioned it, I think a lot more guys are going to get the risk taken on them yeah. if they're able to create more plays with their feet, maybe move outside the pocket, and, you know, that's that's really something that that I think is going to be a trend moving forward because you know how the NFL is a copycat league. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's going to be a trend. I don't think the top guys, though, are going to – you're going to see these guys maybe drafted middle, late rounds, getting – you know, unless they're a – unless they are a Kyler Murray type player, you know, I think they'll get the, the, the quarterbacks you talk about the six, three, the six, five, the big guys, yeah. they'll still get, they'll still get a lot of the top 10 chatter. Uh, but it's the smaller guys. will start getting a little bit more of a look, I think. And, you know, maybe hopefully, you know, it just kind of opens the door to show that, Hey, as long as you got the ability, clearly it doesn't matter how tall you are. That is true. Ability is one thing that people believe this next gentleman have always had. Minus, even with the injuries, many people believe that Cameron Newton has always had the ability to be an elite quarterback. And everybody goes back to the 2015 year uh, NFL League MVP in the regular season. He, did, he played great. But over the past two years, we have seen the play of Cam Newton diminish. And I will say it's mainly because of the injuries, I think. 
if, if you get Cam Newton healthy, he's not, I don't think he's the best quarterback in the NFL. Never has been the best quarterback in the league, but those injuries, not just physically, but mentally, that's mentally taxing knowing I got a big, I got a big 320 D tackle, or I got a D end who is faster than me, stronger than me. That's 260 running at me full speed. He can run a four, four. I got to get away from here because I want to save my body to live another day. Cam Newton going into the season. I was critical. The play of the Patriots, I think they're three and five right now. I turned they, I turned the game off last night because I was like, oh, they're down. They're not going to come back. I think they're down 30 to 17 going into the yeah. fourth quarter. And then Cam Newton and the Patriots found a way to come back to win. And he made a key throw with eight seconds left to set up the game-winning field goal. Cameron Newton's play this year, how have you viewed it? Well, I think uh, coming in this year, you and I, again, were both critical of the fact that we don't, weren't really sure about this move for Cam. Uh, it makes sense for him because you've got to go, you're going to, you know, play under Bill Belichick, a guy that, you know, he's been a, a, a guru as a coach, you know, one of the, he's really been kind of the, uh, the elite level guy that everyone kind of tries to model after. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I think Cam did a really good job of getting his body healthy over the, over the off season. I mean, he was in best, the best shape I think anyone's ever seen him. He was. Um, and yet, yeah. And you mentioned that game against the Jets, they had to come from behind, but he had a couple of key drives in the fourth quarter to bring him back. After the first week, <laughs> I actually really the first two weeks, even the loss against Seattle, we ha I had a feeling I was like, okay, because I predicted on, on our show before the season that I think this could be a, a very good marriage, assuming that the rest of the pieces in New England are healthy, which they're not. <laughs> but uh, the first two weeks, he looked pretty good. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was kind of, he's pretty efficient and he was using both his arm and his feet, he had two touchdowns on the ground in both of the first two games, uh, but then it really kind of fell off. Then he was on the COVID list, and then he came back and he had that just, he laid an egg against San Francisco. Um, and then the last two games, he's picked it back up a little bit, but he's he's really focused on becoming a better passer. And he said it himself, he's been a sucky passer this year. <laughs> I think he finally realizes uh, just being in that room, he's also said, and there was an article that came out in boston.com uh, a couple days ago about Cam Newton and the effect that Bill Belichick has had on him. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought coming in the season that New England could still contend for the the the, the AFC East title. Um, I, clearly, they've got too many injuries and too many holes that that's probably not going to be the case this year. Um, but I'll be really intrigued because I think this is a one-year deal for New England. As far as I think even after this year, they're going to either maybe go make a trade for Jimmy G, who's supposed to be available in a trade at the – the offseason, there's a lot of free agents out there that can be available. So I think Cam is really using this year to try to set himself up for next year. And I think by him just working on being a better passer, something he hasn't really focused on a lot. Um, if he focuses on that, we know what his, his athletic ability is like, even with the injuries. Um, he's still a big threat on the ground. Two more touchdowns on the ground last night. So um, I think it's a possibility. I'm not expecting a lot out of the Patriots anymore this year. But – I do want to pay attention to, does Cam continue to use the tutelage of Bill Belichick to help him for next year or maybe his next contract? Or maybe he stays in New England. I don't, we don't know yet. There's a lot up in the air about Cam. But the potential is still there, even with him being, what, 30, 31 years old. Oh, the potential is there. There's one – I want to – I got some numbers written down on my in my notebook. Stats from Kyler Murray – and Cam Newton. Now, I'm only going to primarily talk about Cam, but there's one number that, that they both have, well, two numbers that they both have that are similar, that, that are the same. Cam Newton leads the team in rushing with 69 carries. And I remember last night during the game, Steve Levy made a comment, middle to the latter part of the second quarter, where he said, Cam Newton still does not have a carry in this game. I personally think, and I'm going to keep going on with this with stats stat real quick, but I personally think that's Bill Belichick and Josh, and Josh McDaniels realizing we got to save this guy's body. We can't yeah. let him be the bruiser that he used to be. That's how he kind of broke it down previously. Another number, these next two connect with, actually next three, I didn't realize that before when I wrote this down. These <laughs> next three all connect with Kyler Murray and Cam Newton. Weird connection. For those of you listening, I didn't look at the stats of the numbers before I told Craig what we were going to talk about. I just came, kind of gave him the athlete, and, and then the numbers kind of fell into place. Cam Newton, eight touch, eight rushing touchdowns. Kyler Murray, eight rushing touchdowns. Cam Newton, seven interceptions that he has thrown on the season. Kyler Murray, seven interceptions that he has thrown on the season. Last one, and I'll throw it off to you, Craig. This connection may be very interesting to you because – 
Cam Newton's already said he needs to be a better passer. I have been critical of, of Cam, Cam Newton's arm throughout his entire career. Even when he was an MVP, it, it was good, but I was very, very critical because some of the throws and a lot of his timing, it's just not there. Cam Newton on the season, 68.1% completion percentage. Kyler Murray, 68.1 completion percentage. For as bad as Cam Newton's arm has been, his completion percentage is a lot better, Craig, than what you may think it is. Yeah, like I said, Cam looked pretty good. He only threw 19 passes in week one, so he was 15 and 19 there. But then his his passing attempts have been all over the all over the map. I mean, he's had he's had two games of under 20 pass attempts, but he's only had two games of 35 or more pass attempts. So everything's been in that healthy like 20 to 25, 20 to 30 range. But as far as Kyler Murray's concerned, you mentioned that outside of the one game against Dallas where he was. Uh, what was that? I have it right here. Nine of 24. Abysmal passing. Yeah. yeah. But every other game after that, uh, 48 pass attempts, 37, 31, 35, uh, 40. Hang on, my computer's not working. 38, 40. So Kyler Murray's pass attempts are way up. So yeah. the fact that he's got right under 70% passing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. take away that one game against Dallas, and I think he's right at 70 or just above 70. So I think – I think as far as volume is concerned, I'm a lot more impressed with Cam Newton's because yeah. of the fact that he hasn't thrown as many passes. Yeah. Do you think that you will see or we will see Cam run less throughout the rest of the season and pass more to save his body? I think that's going to be a main focus for uh, the offense because they're slowly getting some guys back, but they've, they've got, a lot of, they got a lot of holes here. But, I mean – you got some of the games that are coming up for New England. Uh, they still play Baltimore next week. Uh, they play they play against Houston the week after. Then it's Arizona against Kyler Murray. Uh, but the, the teams that they're playing, not a lot of them have strong defenses. Baltimore and Buffalo are the two strongest. Every other defense after that, I mean, you got the Jets again, Texans, Cardinals has been an okay defense, and then both L.A. teams. So I think uh, I think we're going to see probably a little bit more passing, uh, just because some of those teams do have a weaker passing defense. Um, but I mean, against the game, like I don't expect them to play well against Baltimore and Buffalo no. uh, in Week Ten and Sixteen, respectively. But all those games in the middle, I could see him having as long as he continues to stay healthy and you know stay off the COVID list. I think he'll uh, I think he'll have a pretty solid season, which. Is kind of what we were expecting coming in. Not a great season, but a solid season. You mentioned the COVID list. We're going to get to the other player here in a second. But one interesting thing about that, and I know people personally that I know that have had it twice. I don't know if there's an athlete that has been on the list or that has been off, has been had to miss a game twice due to getting COVID during the season. But it is a possibility. And let's say it's I, – I hope this doesn't happen. I know you hope it doesn't happen either. But let's say there's a possibility of him having to – or any player, literally any player in the league, any sport, getting it a second time when they've already gotten it. That would be demoralizing to – like mentally. Now, granted, you're, hopefully – I mean, they don't have any harsh, um, la long-lasting effects from it. We don't want that from anybody. But if they get on that a second time, Craig – that would be something that's like your worst nightmare and your favorite athlete. Imagine your favorite athlete getting it twice and having to miss a game in the championship because they get a second time. You do everything you want to. You ever do everything you can to try to not get it, Craig. But yeah. there's one thing you can't stop is an invisible virus getting into somebody else and then it getting past to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's We haven't seen anybody, like you said, get on it twice yet, but um, we'll We'll see. I, there's, like I said, there's a lot we don't know about this yet. Right. And, and we were, you know, we're, <laughs> we're almost a, close to a year into ha uh, being this thing being around. So, um, you know, if, if they, if Cam Newton were to go on the list again, uh, you've seen what has happened to the quarterbacks in New England <laughs> <laughs> without yes. him there. Yes. For, for as, for as, um, as promisable as Jared Stidham was supposed to be coming in, competing for the starting job, um, jury's still out. There's rumors that the, that New England might trade for Jimmy Garoppolo because San Francisco might be moving on from him. Uh, but they also might be, depending on where they're at, they might draft a quarterback. We don't really know. So if Cam Newton were to go on the list again, heaven forbid, um, I think New England's in trouble, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, guys are taking a lot more precautions, especially after the first test, 
uh, positive tests that is. And they, they, you know, they're making sure they're staying a little bit more isolated, you know, being careful. The league in it, as a whole, I think is trying to do what they can, but I wouldn't be surprised if guys get it again and just, we don't hear about it until after the season because the NFL knows, and I think college football is learning this very quickly. If you don't have your best players on the field, your ratings are going to suffer your, you know, we saw that with the Clemson game. You don't have, you don't have Trevor Lawrence on the field. Look what happens. You know, it's, that's a game that, that they wanted to see. So I think the league is doing what they can, but I would not be surprised to see at the end of the year, oh, this guy, this guy, this guy was alpha. They're all playing with COVID, and I wouldn't be surprised that comes out later. Yeah, no, not at all. One thing that wouldn't surprise me either as we wrap up this show, we got I can't go anywhere without talking about Antonio Brown. Three catches, 31 yards in his debut on the season. He, did, he is on the Buccaneers. They have weapons everywhere. So to a lot of people, him going with – Tom Brady to Tampa Bay may seem crazy. Why would you bring a guy off the street who's been a headache? You, he was on your team previously. You guys cut him, I believe. He was on the team for maybe two weeks, and then he was gone. Prior to that, he was with Mike Mayock, who was a GM of the Raiders, got him up out the paint, off the team very, very quickly. The one knock that nobody has with Antonio Brown is his work ethic and saying that once he got to Tampa Bay, and I don't know who was the one that reported this, he was in very, very, very good shape. One of those guys that I'm not just saying a workout warrior or gym rat in a facetious or sar sarcastic type of way. He is literally that 2AT. And nobody, no matter if it's Mike Tomlin, uh, 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 oh my gosh, what's the coach <laughs> of the Raiders' name? I can't think of his oh, name. Gruden? There you go. Uh, John Gruden. John I knew Gruden. it was a G name. <laughs> John Gruden can't, he's not going to knock, he can't knock his work, uh, Antonio Brown's work ethic. Belichick can't either. Bruce Arians can't. Nobody can knock the work ethic of Antonio Brown. It's all the headache stuff, the locker room cancer that he can't be. But if this works out, Craig, this could be another weapon in a tough division, in a tough side of the, of the league, the NFC, that the Buccaneers could utilize this and say, hey, we already have, we already have great receivers, really good receivers. We can already move the ball. But man, oh man, oh man, if this works, this could be the home run we've been waiting to hit. Yeah, that's it is kind of a kind of a surprise to see him go to Tampa in the first place because you got Godwin and Evans and and Gronk is played, you know, decent here right. and there. You got you got OJ Howard and Cameron Bray, and you've got just the list goes on of all the weapons they have. But it just goes to show you that there is there is some chemistry there between Brown and Brady. Um, that we saw in New England, and you kind of saw it in spurts a little bit there. But the the one thing that I'm really paying attention to is, yes, on the field, you know, I didn't expect a lot out of the first game. 39 right. snaps is about all you can expect from a guy that's still learning the playbook. A couple of the routes, uh, you could tell Brady was expecting him to be somewhere else, and he wasn't. So he's still got to learn that. But this is his, Antonio Brown's, fourth team in under two years. Yeah. Fourth team in under two years. So he still has a pending civil suit from the sexual assault allegation. So mm -hmm. if that were to come back and he's uh, and he's convicted of that, bye-bye NFL, he's gone again. So he's just got to keep his nose clean. And that's always been the MO of him. Um, he's – he uh, – for all the talent he has in the field, he uh, even last night – he he made a he made a really nice catch on the sideline. Got a first down. Did his little ball drop first down thing. He was down thirty to nothing, and bragged about his catch. It's like, come on, man, just get back to the huddle. You're down thirty to zip. It's awesome. You're back on the field, but ego again comes into play there. So that's the really thing you got to worry about. And if everyone's healthy, the other thing you got to focus on. Brady has shown that if he's got pressure. He's, he's not looking down the field anymore. He's looking down towards his offensive line, and that's where we see some mistakes. He had some really ugly passes in this game against the Saints. Um, how are you going to keep everyone happy? I know Mike Evans just wants to win. Godwin wants to win. Gronk wants to win. All those guys do. Brown has shown in the past that he only cares about his numbers, his catches, his money, and that's it, and getting in trouble off the field. That's all he cares <laughs> about. Um, and throwing things from the third story of a hotel. That's all he really wants to do. But – uh, if, I'm just wondering, are they gonna, is he going to be able to keep within his own head and not become a locker room cancer in Tampa Bay where they've got some things set up? I don't think they're going to win the division, but I think they got a lot, of, uh, a lot of things set up there to be able to make a deep playoff run if the matchups lay out right for them. 
They do. And I know, I remember a quote, this isn't verbatim from Bruce Arians, where he was speaking about Antonio Brown, about a conversation those two had. And it was basically, now this is not word for word a quote, but he basically said, get your act together or you won't be here. That's basically it. Now, it's kind of the same way. Now, when us as kids, I know, I don't know how your upbringing was, but when I was a kid, my parents basically said, like, if you don't, if you mess up, this is going to be the consequence. If you get a detention at school for anything, this is the consequence. Now, kids nowadays, they may try to find ways to get around it, but we need that. Us as human beings, not forget an athlete, us as, us as people, we need that guideline. We need that guidance in our life to keep our head on straight because if not, you get an Antonio Brown situation, a guy who's immensely talented, where is off the court dealings and the way he's, he is off the court or off the field. I don't know why I went basketball off the field. <laughs> you find out that it hurts him on the field and it hurts his money. You can be all about your money, Antonio Brown. You can be all about uh, you catching a pass or celebrating a, celebrating a third down. Forget the score of the game. You can be all about that stuff. You can be all about being an athlete, but at the same time. You have so much going on off the field that there there are things that there are things that um, actually also were hurting them, hurting him in Pittsburgh when he was playing well. So whatever happens to him, we're gonna wrap this thing up shortly. I hope this is me. I hope it works out. I hope he's able to have a Randy Moss esque where Randy Moss was a little bit of a headache at some places. But Randy Moss went to New England, balled out. I hope he's able to do that. But my thing that I am kind of questioning, you mentioned it, all the weapons that they have there, he's not going to get the ball as much as he wants. Not as much as he should, as much as he wants. And how does he respond when he when he's wide open or he's open, he's lined up against a nickel corner, he beats him, and he's, he doesn't get the ball? How does he respond with that? That's the thing that I'm questioning, Craig. Uh, last comments you have about this or anything, go ahead, man. Let him out. Uh, yeah, well, you mentioned that he actually, on one of the interceptions Brady threw last night, it's because Antonio Brown cut off his route and didn't complete his route. Probably didn't think he was going to get the ball. Um, but yeah, just want to uh, just want to let everybody know where we can find Final Score, yes. uh, part of Podcast City Network. We do live streams every Sunday morning on Facebook at 10 a.m., uh, either myself and Chris, or we have uh, usually guest hosts every so often uh, it, it, along with Chris. You can find us at www facebook.com slash PCN final score. Um, and you can find us on any streaming platform searching keyword final score. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We just hit a thousand, uh, hit a thousand Facebook followers and likes. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, a couple months ago, that was, that was great. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. And every Sunday, 10 a.m. Yeah. Perfect. Craig, thank you so much. We'll have you on again down the road. Maybe, hopefully, it's not football season, it's basketball season. We'll find something to talk about. Craig, thanks so much for coming back on here on the J. Stevens Podcast. Thanks.